Council Medeiros sits down, and then we're going to rock and roll. Three. Okay, welcome, uh, welcome members of uh, the committee today. Uh, before we start, please sure all cell phones, mobile, and electronic devices are turned off or placed in non-audible mode during the meeting. Council members are prohibited from sending text message, emails, or other electronic messaging during the meeting. Uh, there are no added items to the agenda, but there was a package that you got from, uh, from Lowell on the government relations matters. Is there any changes? Council Plessy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to vary the order a little bit. After delegations, I'd like to go in camera to discuss item 13.1. Okay. So after the def so 13.1, we'll be going in camera, then we'll be coming back out to start the regular, the regular meeting. Okay, so with the changes, can I get an approval of the agenda, please? Council Pleshi, all in favor? That's carried, thank you. Declaration of Interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Seeing none. Uh, the following items are listed with an asterisk are in consent and are considered to be routine and non-controversial by the committee and will be approved at this time. There'll be no separate discussion of any of these items unless a committee member requests it, in which case the item will not be cons consented to and will be considered in the normal sequence of the agenda. Councilor Pelosi. Mr. Chair, I'd like to add 6.2.8, 6.2.9, 6 6.2.10 into consent. There are all traffic related issues regarding U-turns. They involve uh, wards 10, 8, and 6, and I've spoken to the councillors uh, representing those wards, and they're okay with it. Did you say 6.11 6 6 as well? 9 and 10. Just 9 and 10, okay. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. So 6.2.8, 6.2.9, and 6.2.10, we moved into, moved into consent. Any other changes? Okay, seeing none. There are no announcements, so we will get to our delegations. Uh, Councillor Bowman, I believe you are the first for the possible delegation. It's a notice of uh, intention to amend the user fee bylaw 380-2003 as amended Schedule E mobile stage rental user fee. Is there anybody here to talk about that? No, seeing none, then we'll Accept that item. Well, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, there is a report 8.2.1 that goes with that notice regarding the matter, and it was published on the city's website. So if there's no delegations, um, we may as well bring that report forward now. Okay, and sure. If, we'll bring, if nobody has any questions on it, we can approve the report as well. Okay, so we brought 8.2.1. Is there any questions from council on that report? Seeing okay. none, do you want to make a motion then? Okay. Uh, can we have a motion to? Approve the report. All in favor? That carries. Thank you very much. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I believe Councillor Pelleschi, you are the lead on this next delegation. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. This is a delegation from Nazira Jaffer, Executive Director, and Jeanette Vanden Heuvel, Director of Development, and Debbie Travis, Board Chair of Bethel Hospice Re. Bethel Hospice Services, and I believe you have a package in your agendas. Come forward. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, on behalf of Bethel Hospice, represented by my board chair, Debbie Davis, and myself, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for giving us this uh, few minutes to talk to you about Bethel Hospice and to present our delegation to you. Um, I would like to request, Mr. Chairman, if we can have a few extra minutes. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank sure, you. Sure, yep. Okay. So, um, all in favor, a few extra minutes? Good, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'd like to proceed with the presentation. Uh, I'd like to share a, a few ideas about what Bethel Hospice does. So our mission is to support individuals and their families throughout a life-limiting illness, providing exemplary hospice and palliative care. And really, our vision is to provide quality of living for the dying. Uh, we live our core values of compassion, integrity, collaboration, accountability, respect, and excellence. Um, 
Bethel Hospice, which is based in Caledon, provides a residential program that has 10 beds. We also provide a community program that provides palliative care support, bereavement support, uh, in-home visiting, uh, volunteer home visiting as well, spiritual care, social work services, integrated wellness programs. Uh, we have child and youth bereavement programs, and recently we even started child and youth bereavement with art therapy right here in Brampton. Uh, we also have caregiver cafe and movie nights for our clients who are in the hospice. We do journaling through grief and we have death cafes. And we continue to look at other best practices and best programs to support our clients. We also have a very strong volunteer program. We have over 200 volunteers at Bethel Hospice and without our volunteers we would not be able to run our services. Uh, so we continuously look at ways of improving and supporting our, our volunteers and recruit more volunteers that bring in professional skills, etc., to the hospice. Quality is an important aspect of our services, and so we just recently went through our uh, accreditation process with CARF International in the U.S., and we received a three-year accreditation status with CARF International, which is a great achievement. I uh, just wanted to quickly go over the... Um, comprehensive palliative care continuum that we provide. So uh, just wanted to clarify that, uh, you know, the journey for our clients could start in the home, in the community, in the hospital, in the long-term care, or wherever they call home. Uh, we do not provide any restorative care. So if you look at the graph, our care is palliative, where everything has been done, there is no restorative care uh, possible anymore, and it's just relieving the, the client from pain and suffering and making them comfortable, and really providing the quality of living for as long as, uh, as we can do that. And then eventually they go through end of life process and they pass away. And then once they pass away, we continue to provide services and bereavement support to the family members. So I just want to note that um, hospice care, you know, we don't have, it's not a long-term care, it's not a um, uh, compassionate care bed uh, as, as a recovery bed. Uh, it's not a transitional care bed, it's a hospice bed. So that needs to be uh, clear. A little bit about our clients. I do want to uh, draw your attention that the largest number of referrals by city in the Central West Lynn that we serve comes from Brampton. Uh, the graph there shows you over the last three years the highest number of referrals are from the city of Brampton. In terms of our total admissions, uh, the admissions are also aligned with the uh, areas where the clients are referred from. So again, we have almost half of our clients that are admitted that come through Brampton City. Uh, admissions by referral sources, about 57% uh, of our clients come from hospitals, uh, sorry, from home, and 40% come from the hospital, 39% come from the, um, the hospitals, and then a small fraction from long-term care. Our funding, sorry, before we go to the funding, the community program, uh, I mentioned earlier about our community program and the services we provide in palliative care and bereavement support. Uh, you can see our community program growing and we intend to continue to grow our community program. It's a best practice to provide services close to the home and a very cost effective way and we can provide more access and get the biggest bang for our buck. In, in providing the services. With regards to our psychosocial spiritual care, again, we are growing the program and we continue and we do provide a lot of psychosocial and community programs within the city of Brampton. Our funding, 69% um, of our funding comes from the Central West Lynn through the Ministry of Health. Uh, about 30% uh, comes from uh, our foundation through fundraising and then a small amount comes from other sources of funding that we receive. So we do rely heavily on donor funding in order to continue with our services. We recently did a refresh of our strategic plan 2018-2022 and I just want to quickly highlight uh, some of our strategic directions. So as far as the guiding principles, we're looking at excellence in community and residential care 
we look at quality, safety, and efficiency, a very important guiding principle for us, and growth and sustainability. We would like to continue to provide palliative care support to our clients as long as we can, and we want to make our services sustainable. Our strategic directions, equitable access, capacity building, and financial stability. With regards to our priority actions for this year, we want to uh, increase awareness of what Bethel Hospice provides. How, do we, how, how can someone uh, get a referral or uh, get admitted or get access to any of our services? And this is one forum where we are trying to create an awareness. We're also looking at innovative models of care, particularly using uh, technology. And we have embarked on telepalliative services and telebereavement services using Ontario Telemedicine medicine network. Uh, we're looking at organizational culture changes, human resource plan, quality improvement, our volunteer program that I alluded to earlier, and looking at ways of partnering and collaborating with other organizations. So really, really thinking outside the box of how we can do business uh, better in the future and continue with what we do. We have also established a capital plan, and we're looking at ways of creating greater internal alignment. This is just a, a detail of our, our, our strategic plan. You have copies of it in your package, so I will not go through that. Um, just wanted to share one or two quick stories of what we do at Bethel for our clients and why we work there at Bethel Hospice. So this is a picture of uh, beautiful Priscilla, and, and I do have consents from the families and from the clients to share this. Priscilla was uh, five days short of turning 23. And she came to Bethel Hospice, and her wish, her last wish, was to get married. And so her boyfriend was always at the hospital, her fiancé was at the hospital, and we said, okay, we're going to have a wedding at Bethel Hospice. So we had a beautiful wedding for Priscilla, you know, helped her fulfill her last wish. It was a beautiful wedding, and she passed away a couple of days after. That's why we're at Bethel. Another story about, you know, we fondly call her Nan, Nan was a veteran, and she was 97 years old. And uh, she happened to be at the hospice when we were celebrating Remembrance Day. So we brought Nan out. She was in there. Her, her children brought all her regalia and everything. And uh, she talked about her days when she was a veteran. And it was a beautiful story. And the following Friday, we lost Nan. So these are some of the, the stories that we have for our clients. The reasons to support Bethel Hospice, as you know, government funding covers about 60%. To keep our doors open, we need 40% through fundraising, and also we need all those volunteers to help us. So the Bethel Hospice Foundation must raise at least a million dollars every year. How can you help us? You can help us through, you know, continue to support Bethel Hospice by creating awareness of our hospice palliative care and community bereavement support services. Uh, recommend Bethel Hospice services whenever appropriate. Uh, help us by providing us introductions to organizations that support health, community organizations, and individuals within the communities where there is alignment with what we do. And also, please help us encourage financial supporters and donors to invest in our hospice to support our clients. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I asked you to, I, I thank you for, for taking your time to sit down with me and, and Debbie. It was my first year, in the first year of uh, my first term as a counselor, only term as a counselor, um, that Debbie and I had an opportunity to sit down and, and, and talk and I fully didn't understand what Bethel Hospice did for the city of Brampton. Um, it was more so the kind of the rumors around Bethel were, you know, they're, <clears throat> they're in Cowden, they service Cowden. So when I had that opportunity, I was actually shocked with the amount of, of people that, um, that come from the city of Brampton. Yes. Um, I always joke with my parents that once they reached a certain age, so I wouldn't have to take them in, I would put them out on ice flows. And I guess w when I really started thinking about you know that kind of separation and where where they could go or where anybody could send them you know Bethel Hospice was a was a fantastic opportunity for uh, for some individuals that that need it so 
Um, I know that uh, you're not here asking us for any taxpayers' dollars. Mm -hmm. You're here asking us to to bring awareness yes. and to and to help Bethel as as much as you're helping our community. So, again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Who have the next uh, next delegation is you as well, Councillor Pleshi. No. Is it five point three? Okay. Yeah. I'll speak after. I'll speak after. It's my. I'm the chair. I'm chairing, chairing it. it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Our next delegation from Stephen uh, Wong, Senior Vice President, Hockey Shot Inc., regarding implementation of synthetic rinks in Brampton. Thank you, Chairman and committee members, for having me this morning. I'm here to introduce you to a product that we uh, manufacture called Hockey Shot Extreme Glide Synthetic Ice. It's an amazing uh, alternative to real ice that is used by the best in the world. Uh, we are used by the LA Kings, the Montreal Canadiens, the Ottawa Senators, EA Sports. It's a cost-effective, cost-saving alternative to real ice, uh, and I'm a proud resident of Brampton. I would like to see Brampton implement this uh, to show that we are on the cutting edge of number one, hockey development, uh, number two, quality of life, uh, or vice versa. So instead of bringing synthetic ice and doing a demo for you this morning, um, I have some videos uh, that will keep you entertained and informed. You also have um, a package, uh, a PDF, that will tell you more details that you can look over at your own time. They'll provide you all the specs and show why we are the best. Uh, so, Sonia, if you could roll the first clip. Um, mainly clips from the Staples Center uh, in LA uh, at an LA Kings uh, hockey game and um, you, I heard a few chuckles when we saw Shea Weber so Shea Weber is a Montreal Canadiens hockey player uh, I believe his salary is in around eight million dollars a year um, and we were selected by McDonald's to do uh, a commercial so you can imagine with a big corporate uh, entity like McDonald's and a high paid player like Shea Weber, that they really conduct their due diligence to look for something that is gonna prevent injury or avoid injury, something that's gonna truly simulate ice, um, and obviously um, something very versatile. That was in the middle of a field in Kenmore, Alberta, a 120 acre ranch, where we set up 300 feet of synthetic ice where Shea Weber actually raced uh, against a cowboy on a horse. So he did that run about 100 times, um, did, did that skating segment about 100 times. We had a double, um, a, a junior player who had his kind of look, his dimensions, suited up like him, and he also did it another 150 times. We had drones and everything in the air. So uh, just for your entertainment, I'll run that commercial now.
Everybody gets lucky once. You got that right. <laughs> you got that right. Thank you. <laughs> so for anyone who plays hockey or, or skates, uh, you can see in that clip that on our synthetic ice, um, there is complete edge control. Everything that you can do on real ice, you can do on our ice. Uh, the difference is we have about a 10% coefficient, uh, coefficient of friction, which is actually great for developing fundamental uh, skills. You have to bend your knees more. You have to stroke through the strides more. Uh, you can't be lazy and gliding around. What's also uh, fantastic about our product is that it can be used indoors, it can be used outdoors, and the cost savings is incredible. Um, I've been told, I haven't confirmed this, but I've been told that uh, it costs $400 an hour to run uh, a sheet of ice. So based on that, on a 40-hour week, you know, our product for an NHL-sized arena would pay off in about two and a half months. And again, it can be used outdoors. Uh, it's great for everyone, all the way up to an NHL pro or a, a top figure skater in the world, all the way down to um, a two-year-old who's never skated all the way to the other extreme. If you're a 90-year-old senior, it's much safer. Um, so you're not gonna slip and fall like you would on real life, uh, or on real ice. Um, and if you do fall, um, it's much softer. It's not like a hard ice surface. Um, I'm gonna show the next clip is Elvis Stoico in a residential environment. Uh, this is actually in my basement. And Elvis Stoico is the one that put me on to um, this product. Uh, I'm a pro athlete trainer as well. I train UFC fighters, NHL players, and Olympians. And I had asked Elvis for advice, being the best skater in my opinion on the planet. I asked him for his advice on synthetic ice. And he had explained to me that he's been using synthetic ice for 30 years. Uh, and he said that there's a lot of them that have lubricants, additives, gels, grease, and they're very messy, they're not good, the resistance is too much, there seams. And he explained to me, this is going back four years, he explained to me that Hockey Shot has by far the best product on the, uh, in the world on the market. And uh, this is a clip from Elvis. Lifestyle. One is the best stuff ever. Uh, we uh, I always think this has to throw on my feet. This stuff's been awesome, and uh, you know I'm excited to get out on it. What if you had this when you were like growing up? How much of an advantage would that have been? I think it would have been huge. I mean, to have a space uh, in my basement, in my house, where I can train, where there is a little bit more friction, so you have to push a little bit harder. So you're using the muscles a little bit more, so you're training a little harder. Back in the day when we wanted to train a little harder, we would skate on ice. It's been skated on for two or three hours, and you have to push through the snow and all the ice and, and, and that and so forth. So it made it more difficult. Essentially, that's kind of like the same thing with the synthetic guys have to push harder but to get the extra training in the extra time and when you get back on regular ice you just fly because you, you train all those muscles and, and you push harder and that becomes much easier absolutely train a lot of hockey players anywhere from like age play to nhl level when i get people on this right when they go on the the real ice they're like wow my god so much faster so much more explosive they're really really benefits. Um, kind of like Muhammad Ali he used to train underwater, uh, doing his like shadow box underwater for that resistance that you're talking about and really pays off obviously when you get out of water you feel that much faster. So those are some of the benefits we're gonna go through and uh, show you some stuff that we can do on here. And again Elvis mentioned it. It's great even down here we've had some time. So anyone that wants to see that clip uh, the full clip you can look it up on on YouTube. Um, but in addition to um, community and families and uh, where people can gather and skate leisurely. Uh, I'm, I'm highly involved in hockey myself, not only as a trainer, uh, but I coach uh, both my son's teams. Uh, both my sons started in Brampton hockey. Uh, my younger son is still in Brampton hockey. My older son, I had to take him to the GTHL for uh, higher level development, higher level uh, competition. Um, and I would like to, and this, is, this has been a trend that's been going on forever. Tyler Sagan, Rick Nash, big NHL players from Brampton. They, no one stays in Brampton hockey. They all go to the GTHL. I would like to help Brampton hockey retain our talent, develop our talent, 
and this would be a great step. This is, you know, Kucherov uh, for NHL fans out there. You know, he was the second leading scorer in the NHL this year. He was actually leading Connor McDavid all year up until the last two weeks of the season. He bought our product uh, last summer, put it in his garage. He trained on it all summer long. And before the season started, uh, he was interviewed and he said, I think I'm going to have a great year this season because I've been practicing in my garage. Um, Kucherov, John Tavares, Brent Burns, the list goes on and on, the who's who of the NHL. Uh, so I'd love for Brampton Hockey to also implement this and you know, keep, our, keep our kids here, develop our talent here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we have a few, a list of speakers, and um, I think uh, mm -hmm. what you said about keeping our talent is uh, certainly uh, resonates with me, and I hear more and more of our kids going to either the GTHL or uh, um, other municipalities, and yeah. I, I think that uh, that's a bigger issue, and, and maybe this can be something that, uh, that brings them back for sure. But first, Councilor Gibson. Correct. One thing you said, you said no one stays in Brampton Hockey. That's not true. Yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I apologize. That was, that was a stretch. There are, there are a few that have made the NHL and done very well. Um, Mr. Chair, our procedural bylaw says that we have a delegation with a request, and the request is the implementation of synthetic ice rinks in Brampton that we refer it back to staff when we don't have a report in front of us. I think that's wise advice. I, I would like to move that motion right now to refer it back to staff to work with this gentleman. I think just from my point of view, my son uh, used synthetic ice when goalie training over 20 years ago. Wow. So, and it How was, was your product back then? It, was, it wasn't great ice back then as it was, but it was certainly, as you say, very good for strengthening their legs. Indeed. Too, and, and for a goalie. So it was it worked out pretty well for him. So I, I move referral. Thank, Thank you. you. Comment on the referral uh, during your questions of the delegate, uh, Mayor Jeffrey. Stephen, nice to see you again. My pleasure. Thank you. I uh, saw Stephen. I came and did a presentation in my office. I don't know, two months ago, maybe a little longer. And I told him the procedure. I said to come here and that we would uh, hopefully be impressed enough that we would send staff away to have a look. And uh, what I was impressed with is that he's a Brampton native, so that's very important. And I think we as a city need to look at alternatives, how to, to be more uh, creative, and cost efficient, and looking at new technologies to help our athletes. So I just thought his video um, with the horse was really cool, and I wanted everybody <laughs> else to see it. Um, Thank you. I really don't care about hockey that Thank much, uh, having spent many, many years in arenas. Um, this looks a lot more comfortable than the places I was staying in. So as hopefully as a grandmother, I'll be back in the arenas, and maybe there'll be some different products. So. I'm happy to support the referral. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Jeffrey. Councillor uh, Medeiros. Uh, thank you for the chair. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, when I first met Stephen, just to uh, remember as a council, um, not only is Stephen as a businessman, I refer to him as a renaissance man because he's a, a filmmaker and he sits on the board of PAMA. Um, so he's really dedicated to the arts. Um, and I had the opportunity and privilege to meet him and learn more about uh, what he does and, and I thought that uh, especially being a Bramptonian and, and someone who's so passionate about hockey and passionate about the arts uh, that he come in here and, and uh, make those connections with the city because just looking from the product per se uh, it does speak to the cost effectiveness and, and it does align with our master plan when we're talking about sports excellence. So I support the referral and I thank you again Stephen for your contribution and, and really uh, uh, focusing on this municipality as your resident and, and expressing your passion in terms of uh, putting Brampton on the map. So I thank you very much. Thank, thank you Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Moore. Thank you very much. Uh, I too uh, support referral but I'm wondering if staff needs some direction on that referral. Uh, in other words, you know, what are you, what are we referring it back to? I mean, clearly the product needs, you know, an evaluation from a staff perspective. But as a member of council, when it does come back, I'd like to know what's the cost of transitioning? What are the opportunities for summer programming? You know, I, I think this is more than just sending it back to, to come back and say, you know, it's a great product. Indeed. Um, I, I personally would like to see um, whether or not uh, staff would recommend a, a pilot, um, how it could be utilized in community 
neighborhood parks to encourage uh, this kind of physical activity through the summer months and to teach little ones to how to skate. I guess I'm kind of curious um, as well um, how it would impact on, I mean, clearly with an ice rink, the real ice, the temperature in our recreation facilities needs to be um, at a certain level to maintain that ice at, at optimum. You know, how does it change our heating costs or our, our cooling costs in those facilities? I think it's, yeah, personally, I'd like to see a, a pretty comprehensive yep. um, review of this that sort of covers all the, you know, potential for cost savings, but more importantly, um, keeping the community active uh, and the opportunities for that. You know, when I think about the number of people in neighborhood parks who or who surround a neighborhood park who say, you know, we'll, we'll water it down if, if the city comes and, and builds the boards for us. Yeah. But it's so reliant on the kind of winter that you have. Indeed. For yeah. that. So, um, anyways, well, one, thank one you big for your benefit point. is the maintenance is almost non existent. <clears throat> um, it can work in, so the Shea Weber commercial, it was 27 degrees out and sunny. Uh, this can be used in sub zero temperatures. Basically, all you have to do is sweep it off. If you're indoor, if you're outdoor, um, the, the shavings, just like on real ice when you do a hockey stop, you'll shave snow. This, you will shave um, plastic surface. And it, it just basically blows away. Um, and it's non-toxic and it's all been tested for that environmental, environmentally. Um, so as far as cost savings for maintenance, it's tremendous. Well, I noticed Elvis didn't do many jumps in your basement. <laughs> I, my ceiling <laughs> isn't that high, but um, at my office, he does do jumps. And for anyone who saw him uh, a few weeks ago at Stars on Ice at Air Canada Centre, and my <laughs> sister saw him just a few days ago in Vancouver on Stars on Ice, everyone was mentioning that he, at his age especially, is more explosive than he's ever been. He outperformed uh, Patrick Chan, uh, obviously, Tessa and Scott got the big applause, mm -hmm. uh, but he was by far the most dynamic skater, and he will stand here in front of you and tell you why, and it's because of the ice, in, in his opinion. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Harry, any comments on uh, the relation to what Councillor Moore was saying about the referral? Through you, uh, Chair, no. We, we would do a thorough review and, and come back, and, um, you know, I don't see it replacing ice, but maybe complementing it. But yeah, we'd come back. Yeah. yeah, in my opinion, nothing can ever replace ice. But also there's a tremendous cost in building arenas and putting ice in and maintenance and ventilation and, and preventing mold and, and condensation and all those things. So as an adjunct, um, and when you see people like Elvis Stoiko doing it and Kucherov and Tavares, <coughs> there's a reason why all these people are using this product. And it's because it can aid in development and it's very cost effective but if you're going to play a game of NHL hockey yeah we're not I, I wouldn't want to play it on synthetic ice you can do it but I want to play it on real ice. Councillor uh, Sprovier. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you Stephen. Uh, My pleasure. I really appreciate your uh, coming here today. Um, I, I do support the referral and I'd like to get some more information. Uh, the uh, uh, one of the main uh, to staff and many of the main issues I like to be addressed is um, the um, uh, the life expectancy of the product uh, and uh, and also whether the uh, plastic shavings are um, uh, biodegradable or whether they're uh, they'll just be flying around and you know become more plastic in the environment uh, so that's something I like to uh, I think it's an important two important issues very good questions um, the life expectancy of commercial use is seven to ten years per side. Um, again, if it's not being used as much, it will last much longer. So it is two-sided. So once it shaves down enough on one side, it can be flipped over, and then obviously you get another seven to ten years. Whether it's biodegradable or not, I'll have to, I'll have to look into that uh, more. I know it is, it is non-toxic. I know that uh, it's hypoallergenic. We'll have to look to see whether it's biodegradable. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Sprovier. Um, my only question is, um, around, you know, we don't have enough um, off-ice programs in the city of Brampton when it comes to um, in the summer. Um, Indeed. We have a, 
you know, we have a lot of other programs that kind of take over with lacrosse and, and soccer and baseball and, and such. Um, my question is, could you essentially stall this, install this in an arena and then play lacrosse on, on it? Very good question. Um, so that's my basement there. And like I said, I train UFC fighters as well. I train other athletes. And that, it is a multi-purpose uh, surface. So although it's slippery when you have skates on, when you have shoes on, I do plyometric training. I do, I do uh, explosive jumps on there. I do um, you know, ladder drills. So you can play other sports. I have a client right now that's playing tennis as well. He put lines on it uh, for tennis. So it is multi-purpose. Okay, but directly to my question about lacrosse, and, and you know, a lot of the kids, you know, yeah. they get hit a lot and they slide yeah. around and their legs are bare. Is yeah. there any opportunity for their legs to get cut on, on sharp edges? So I, I don't play lacrosse, but um, if I were to imagine it, I have, I have fallen on that in shorts mm -hmm. and it, it's a smooth surface. Right. So I would, I would prefer to fall on that than turf okay. by, by far. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. That exhausts my list of questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. So the referral is, I'll take the motion on the referral back to staff. First moved by Councillor Gibson, all in favor? That carries. I also need a motion to receive both delegations. Councillor Medeiros, all in favor? That carries. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we are moving now into, to deal with item 13.1. We're gonna be moving into closed. And then we'll come back out to deal with the sequence of the agenda. Going, I think we're going in that room there, yeah. Okay, welcome back. We're now back to the regular part of the agenda for the Public Works and Engineering section. Uh, first item is 6.2.1. It's the report from Chris Diverson, uh, Director of Transportation and Special Projects. We're here to receive it and uh, make them all okay. Everybody uh, questions on it? Recommendations? Has everybody read the recommendations? Okay, move it. You want to move it? Council Bowman? You want to move it? All in favor? That carries. John, okay, let's do that again. Please let's pay attention here. All in favor of the recommendations of the report 6.2.1. All in favor, great. That carried. Thank you. The next report is 6.2.11 from Traffic Operations Technologist, Public Works and Engineering, General Traffic Bylaw 93-93 as amended its administrative update. It's a recommendation. Can I get a mover? Councillor Moore, do you have a question? Actually, it's more of a comment. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody else. Uh, I read my agenda online, and because this report was 220 some odd pages. No, it's 6.2.12. Are you 2. not on 6.2.11? 6.2.11 is traffic bylaw amendment. 6. The one that was 100, 200 is 6.2.12. Sorry, which one are we on now? We're on 6.2.11, yes. Well, that's the one. That's no, the one that is 200. No, I think you must have missed a page. No. 6.2. 6.2. I, my apologies. We're on 6. .2. That's the next report. Okay. Would you like to move 6.2? Yeah, I'll put move 11. Okay. Yes. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Now, the question. So, the question is this. 
When you're reading it online and you have 200, a report that's 200 and some odd pages, um, having it load uh, and so that you can actually go through the agenda is really tough. Can I make a suggestion that when there is a report that is that long, that for purposes of online you put a link to the report? That would be a lot easier because I, you know, my, my uh, iPad kept shutting down as you're scrolling, trying to get to the next report on it. So I think it is quite achievable. Rather than putting the whole report online, just simply put a link to it um, for purposes of it being uh, so voluminous. Okay? Okay. Suggestion Case. only. Yeah, okay. So now we have the report in front of us. It's a budget amendment for the closing of Goreway Drive and request to begin procurement, purchasing bylaw 4.0, Goreway Drive CN Rail grade separation at South City Limits in Ward 8. Councilor Pleshi, you're on the board. Hey, Mr. Chair, can I ask staff to give a quick uh, synopsis sure. of the report, please? Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project has been a, an ongoing uh, discussion point between uh, the municipalities of Mississauga and Brampton for over 10 years. The, um, the EA was actually filed in 2008. Um, I personally remember when I was on the, on the dark side, I, I met with Councillors Provieri and Councillor Eve Adams at the time from Mississauga uh, in, back in uh, 2011. And all those years we've been trying to get this project off the ground. The, the railroad track that crosses Goreway Drive causes a lot of problems for, for commuters. Uh, there are delays. Uh, the train is supposed to clear w with less than five minutes. Oftentimes, because of the shunting that goes on on the spur track, the, the delays are much longer. Uh, certainly a major problem for commuters, and, and uh, in fact, it's a huge problem for our own transit uh, that try to run a bus on schedule up and down the street. But even more importantly, uh, with, the annu with the average uh, annual daily traffic of, of around 15,000 cars per day, and the fact that there are tw of, of excess of 50 train movements um, every day, uh, there's a formula that, that's used for an exposure index of cars to trains. And for a great separation to be warranted, uh, when you multiply the, the AADT times the number of trains, if you get 200,000, you warrant a grade separation. In this particular crossing, uh, the exposure index is 750,000, so it's three times, three times the warrant limit. One of the biggest hurdles that we had in getting this project off the ground was land acquisition. Um, so we finally finished that uh, earlier this year. And once we did that, we started to get into some serious discussions with uh, CN. Actually, we started them last fall. And CN came up with the suggestion, look, they said, you know, now that we're seriously looking at this, uh, they had no comments during the EA, but once we got into detailed design, they said, look, like for us to move, uh, move our rail line, to detour it, along with the switch gear, along with the communications gear, uh, would you consider closing the road during construction. So we had a look at it, and part of that huge report that you see that's a, one of the appendices, uh, and I kind of apologize, I, I, I let that slip, I, you shouldn't have had the whole report, but I guess it goes to show you that it was studied to a very, very uh, large degree. So if, if, if that report does anything, it just goes to show you that there's a lot of calculation, a lot of thought going into what would happen if we did close the road. Uh, we met with Mississauga staff, and they concur that uh, the, the closure of the road is, is probably the right way to go. Um, so they're going concurrently with us to, to their council as well for, for a road closure. We're at the stage now of our design work that we really have to know whether the road is going to be closed or not, because if it's not, then the detour, rail detour and road detour are both in play and we have to redesign uh, or design, do more design work than we've done already. So we have two asks. Uh, the one ask is um, for the road to be closed for a period of uh, approximately two years. 
Um, and the other is to bring the funding forward from 2019. We had uh, identified this as a 2019 project. Um, so the funding, uh, our estimate at this point in time is around $32 million strictly for the project. 60% of that infrastructure that's being built is within the city of Brampton, but Mississauga uh, is, is uh, on, on board to pay 50% of uh, all uh, contract and related costs. And uh, that summarizes the project. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Question? Yep. Work that staff has put into this. I think it was some two years ago that um, I led a de delegation at Emil uh, in front of the province, and, and their lack of um, um, you know understanding to the amount of work that we had already put in, and um, <clears throat> was it was kind of a little bit disappointing. But I realize now, you know that. Um, Staff have done tremendous amount of work on this um, with the land acquisition, dealing with the province, and dealing with CN, two very tough cookies to deal with. I think that um, it was probably a very hard decision to sta for staff to come and recommend closing roads as it is anytime you want to close a road, but um, I strongly believe that you know closing this road is the best alternative and the cheapest alternative to, to carry forward. So just again, Mr. Chair, I'd like to acknowledge the amount of work that staff had done on this and, and thank them very much. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Pelosi. Councilor Spoberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Joe, um, so the, uh, when the, this process was um, being um, carried forward and design and decisions being made, um, was it decided at back then that uh, the best way to go was to close the road or was there uh, any thought about giving about doing a detour like uh, they've done on um, uh, Torbram Road uh, that's been there's a, a detour there that uh, has been put in place and uh, people are still able to travel north and south while the construction of the bridge the bridge has been uh, is underway and I, I haven't been by there lately but I believe Last year it was still under construction. It's been probably a couple of years. So that was because the reason I ask is that Goreway is a very busy road. It brings people from Brampton into the GO station, and that's the most popular route. And it certainly will be a huge impact for all those travelers to go to the GO station in Malta. Uh, so was was that never thought of uh, about uh, making provisions for the detour? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the uh, the original <coughs> concept and and the EA actually showed uh, a rail detour and a road detour, and you have to put it in context. I mean that was in 2008. At the same time, and, and Councillor, you mentioned the, um, the the Torbrum Road grade separations because we knew they were going to be going at the same time. So we looked at uh, having traffic flow, uh, although constricted in both areas. But now that we're, we fast forward it to 2018, uh, happily the Torbrum road grade separations are coming to a conclusion. So we're going to have unimpeded traffic by the time on Torbrum, by the time this, this project actually gets started. So I, although it's not, an ideal detour, but it is a parallel road and an option for people to use uh, with absolutely no stops because there are two underpasses. The other thing I'd like to mention is that this is only possible because this is an overpass grade separation, not an underpass. With an underpass, you would need a rail detour in any event to basically uh, dig out the earth and then put a bridge over top and then put the train on top of the bridge. So that has to happen in any case. But because this is an overpass uh, and we just have to build up the approach uh, fills on either side of the track, uh, it, it is an option for us here to not detour the rail and it saves a lot of money. Yeah, I, I understand that through the chair. Uh, so the, uh, so work, the work is going to be scheduled to start this year then? 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we intend to uh, have the tenders out by September. Uh, by the time things get organized, I really don't think you're going to see a lot of action there till possibly uh, early, early 2019. Okay, so um, can we put up some signage um, to um, to inform people that uh, once the council makes a decision to close the road, that uh, that uh, what will happen um, probably going. Uh, early 19 that uh, the road will be closed so people can start making arrangements to find other routes to get to uh, to their destination through you mr. chair we plan to have uh, a public uh, public meeting and we will have uh, changeable message signs uh, as we get closer to uh, the actual work uh, so maybe within a month before something like that we'll, we'll put out the signage okay thank you Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And could I move the chair be heard? Just quickly, um, Joe, thank you for the report. I read through it, a lot of detail. Can we just make sure that CN has their flag guys there on a regular basis when, they, when they're needed? Because we know the difficulty we had, and it was a different thing. It was a grade separation at Credit View, but sometimes the flagmen weren't there and we couldn't continue on the work. So can you, we make sure and get the assurance that they're going to be there when they're needed? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, to you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll use our best efforts for sure. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Fortini, this is in your word. Would you like to move the report? Thank you. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Uh, there is no new business. 6.3 is in consent. Correspondence council question period. Any questions? None. Public question period. Is there anybody from the public here? I don't see anybody regarding public works. So we will now break for lunch oh okay well okay we'll turn it over to councillor Pleshi. he's only got one item i believe on his agenda it's over to you i I'm want happy to, do, to it there. do it from here yep uh welcome everybody to the community services section of uh we have no present staff presentation our reports item 7.2.1 <coughs> is a new bus maintenance and storage facility are there any members of the committee that like to speak on this <coughs> Seeing none, Council Medeiros, you'll move this. All in favor? That carries. Item 722 is in consent. 731 is in consent. Councillor, question period. Any members of uh, committee have any questions regarding community services? Councillor Medeiros. Um, this one's directed to the commissioner. I'm not sure uh, who's. Oh, okay. Uh, for Al. Um, at the time, I had raised the issue with uh, the director, or not with Al, actually with the director, uh, Boyce. Um, when we register, so I was part of a group that was looking to get gym space. Um, and one thing I noticed, we, we say on one end that it's first come, first serve. So a community group has to get in line to get access to one of our facilities, be it a gymnasium or so on. However, it's not a real first come, first serve. It's actually because we automatically uh, renew groups who have been there for the last seven to ten years. And so it's first to come first serve of the rest of the available space. So I, I'm wondering if you're following me. Did you I understand what I'm? Yeah, so my, chair, yep. my concern with this is that there's, uh, especially with the way Brampton's grown in the last 10 years, 15 years, uh, there's new groups who are formed, there's new uh, teams that want to get access to the gyms, and they're at a disadvantage due to our uh, registration system. And I know part of the issue is that uh, we lack space and that's and it's a competitive process but I was hoping that at the time that there would be something coming back to us in terms of how we can change it up that it gives fair and equitable access similar to what we're doing in other uh, be it with arts and culture to our spaces how can we ensure that there's fair and equitable access to that so I'll leave that uh, for staff to mull over and hopefully um, you know, I'd, I'd hope that there'd be some more information on when we can expect some type of report or looking at the process uh, through the chair, uh, our director, Rec, the Derek Boyce, he's working on this, and he will report back to, we will bring a report back to the council. Great. Thank Good you on. very much. Thank you, Councilor Medeiros. Uh, public question period. Any members of the public have any questions regarding community services? Seeing none. Um, Councilor Bowman, you have one report. Do you want to go with that? And then we'll, I'll pass the chair over to Council. Councillor Bowman. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. I guess You're the I'm. You're the chair. I guess I'm Through live. Um, in uh, economic development culture section, we did cover off report 
um, 8.2.1 when we had the delegation, uh, 5.1 this morning. Uh, there is no other new business. There's no correspondence. Any questions from Council? Councilor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Um, I think there should be no surprise to, uh, I guess, uh, economic development. Um, I became aware of an issue uh, regarding uh, our access to the uh, summer space, or I guess how we are allowing groups to rent uh, our, our space in the Garden Square. Um, this leads to the fact, uh, um, last year there was a very successful, uh, I guess, Portuguese uh, uh, event which was hosted downtown Brampton. Um, and uh, I guess the organizer, um, when looking for the same dates, was told that uh, the date was no longer available because uh, based on uh, information that I received yesterday from staff, and I thank you for that information, that we underwent uh, a new process in how we make accessible uh, Garden Square. Um, so I was wondering if staff can uh, highlight and, and explain to me um, just some follow-up questions on how this new process was implemented. Um, and uh, I was told in the email that there was subject matter experts, uh, that there was an evaluation. And uh, so I was just hoping that uh, I'd get further uh, comments on it. If need be, I'm open to uh, a report to come back for next week council, if that would be better, but I'll leave it up to staff's uh, discretion. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, for Garden Square this year, we actually started a process where there was proposals, a call for proposals for those events that wanted to be organized in Garden Square that were independent, so they weren't sort of in collaboration with a city-run event. So there were a number of applications that were received. There was only two spaces that were available for Garden Square presenting this year based on city programming. Originally, when we set city programming this year, we thought that there would be implications with the uh, road closures and everything else. So when the road closures were extended as part of the reimagine, we reevaluated the summer and recognized there was some opportunity to add some independently run festivals. At that time, the call for proposals was sent out to all of the people that had expressed earlier interest in Garden Square, and proposals were received. Once they were received, they were evaluated by a committee that included both city staff as well as uh, stakeholders in the downtown or stakeholders that are also participating in supporting festivals and events. So each of those applications was evaluated and once determined, sort of the, the highest scoring based on the set criteria, was who was offered the space in Garden Square for those two festival spaces this year. Um, I guess through the chair. Um, Again, in terms of the process and who are the committee members, can you mention stakeholders? Uh, would that information be available to us who were committee members? So you're saying that it was the BIA or who, are the, who would be the downtown stakeholders? How, were the, how was the committee selected? Uh, the committee was selected using the committees that we had for the community grant program. So the same committee members that evaluated the event proposals that we received as part of the community grant were the evaluators for the Garden Square proposals. So what type of criteria would have been applied? So, uh, you know, where I'm going with this, and, and this is an issue that I've, I've seen with other groups. So we have a, a stakeholder group that is a considerable large community in Brampton. Um, we talk about cultural heritage of Brampton, and they're a group that, um, notwithstanding the fact, the contribution they made to the city, and they have probably the most successful event that we've seen downtown Brampton. So there's a history and a track record of something. And to tell me, that based on subject matter or, or I guess a committee made a uh, determination of an independent. So th there's a lot of questions in terms of the definition of what an independent mean. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a collaboration with the city so that we're saying that we're frowned upon. It's frowned upon because we'd have to use city resources or uh, what criteria was applied to it. And then essentially our what I feel that we, we've done, um, we've essentially took a process We've had uh, a group that, you know, I've personally worked on getting those type of investments and, and getting that type of celebration here in the city um, that have, you know, roots within the community. So these are our community that celebrates. And finally, a community group has something that they don't have to travel to Toronto for. Uh, you have the success around it. And then I have problems to understand that we decide to, you know, move and change the significance, especially being that it's during Portugal Heritage Month. 
uh, you know, I, I just don't feel that it's, you know, where's the sensitivity to the community group? And uh, if you tell me that, so it, it's hard for me to discuss and, and do a comparator based on, you know, understanding, respect the process, but then after at what cost and, and in reference and in terms of the benefit, the cost benefit analysis of what event is coming, and I'm sure it's probably a good event, but we've essentially, um, as a municipality, just let down a community group that, you know, as of today, I keep getting solicitations on when this event is supposed to happen because it usually, it usually coincides with the fact when we do our flag raising. Um, so I was taken off guard about, you know, all these decisions and how it was made and the way it was communicated. Um, but all the other questions, I, I can take it offline because this is probably not the big, you know, discussion to have here. But I, I think there's a... Um, there's a review that's required that when we look at our processes, and our processes are supposed to be, uh, you know, business-like, but at the same time, we've almost taken the heart of what our, our municipality is. It's its people. It's, it's the symbolisms around a community group that can come here to our downtown and have a successful event uh, which engages members of our community, which we've never had before. And when it's starting to build roots, we've basically said that through this process that... Uh, no longer, and it was a, in, in, in this process, I don't remember even it was an ad hoc process uh, based on understanding on the dates. So there, there's a lot of, I guess, uh, discussions around this, but ultimately what ends up happening is we just lost this event. And so I guess what I'm hoping that staff will do is, is contact the event organizer to see if there's a possibility that we can find another suitable space similar to what Garden Square could be or alternate dates, but I think um, this is one of those that, you know, I was taken by, I was taken by surprise. I think many folks were taken by surprise. Um, and I don't know how this was, like, communicated to us in terms of how this decision-making would be making. Um, I'd be interested and curious to see who were the, you know, the, what the criteria was applied to, what uh, the selected groups, and what expected impact do we have, um, especially in the year of World Cup. Uh, it's just, I don't know, I, I, uh, I've been on the other side, and I'm just mind-boggled as a, about this whole process and how the decision was made. And I'm interested to see how reflective our cultural heritage, you know, these type of events and what type of weight is considered to this. It's, uh, it's just on, on all levels, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed personally. I'm disappointed um, as a member of that community and I'm disappointed for the community as this was our, our chance to build uh, something that was solid and we initiated last year with something that was more successful that um, I, I would not find a more successful event in our downtown. Councillor Moore. Thank you. I guess the risk of question period is it generates some questions. So just on the, the point that Councillor Medeiros, when were the dates offered? The, because we, it, it turned out we had a couple of extra dates that weren't booked for community events, is, is if I understand correctly. Uh, through the chair, the call for proposals opened on April 16th. Oh, so very recent. Very recent, yes. So, um, whatever groups so there were two dates two extra dates there were there were a number of uh, dates that could be made available okay. but resources in accordance with the the community programming and other events that were happening okay but on these particular there was two groups that wanted one date that was out there and offered um, through the chair so the process was that a call for proposals went out to all of those different organizations that had expressed interest so we received a number of proposals and all of those were evaluated the two that had sort of the the top score based on that evaluation similar to the community grant program okay. were offered those dates that they were interested in so the the second group the group that councillor Madero spoke about it's I'm going to assume that they were um, organizing their event prior to April so we're not saying we can't they can't have the event they just can't have it in Garden Square through the chair that's okay. correct um, and I and I'm assuming that this was um, um, with the number of community groups using it it's consistent with the or not using it I guess is consistent with what we approved with um, Brendan Healy and the plan for programming that space as part of the Rose Theatre um, programming, I guess? 
uh, through the chair, we didn't have a process to call for proposals prior to this year. So because okay. of the increasing demand to use Garden Square, we wanted to create an, a, a fair and equitable process so that everybody had the opportunity to apply okay. for and be evaluated. No, on. and I think, um, you know, Councillor Medeiros, I, I understand, you know, we're, we're sort of new to this game, and I'm just going to give you some advice. You know, these kind of things need to be non-political because what will happen is we it won't be just one group knocking on your door. It will be multiple groups and either we give direction to staff to, to book it, um, to evaluate and, and assign the dates or we or they come with a list of, of potential asks and we make this decision politically. But we, we can't have it both ways. It's um, I understand what you're saying with the soccer and obviously the Portuguese community being a big uh, fan of soccer. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if we leave it up to staff, then we have to leave it up to staff because we'll just get, we'll get bombarded. We've done the same thing with the grants, you know, and I've seen it unfold at the region where, you know, it, you know, back in the early 2000s, there was this perception that in order to get grants, you had to have a political champion or advocate at the table. And um, you know from since your time being there, we just don't get those asks anymore because it is an administrative process um, that allows it to be evaluated. So I guess, sorry, I, I sort of, I'm sorry. It is, it is I question. sort of extended beyond question. question, but, but uh, it, your issue raised some questions for me in, in that regard. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Medeiros, you'll take that offline with, uh, with uh, Kelly and Bob. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. There's no other questions. We will move on to uh, public question period. Is anybody from the public here? Questions? No questions? Okay. Thank you. We will uh, move past public <laughs> question period. Uh, next up is corporate services. So, I believe we'll probably break for lunch before corporate services? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is half an hour enough? Half an hour okay with everyone? One o'clock? Half an hour okay. Okay. One o'clock? It's 35 minutes. One yeah, one o'clock. <laughs>
So we'll uh, sorry, I wouldn't say spent. It's it's allocated towards capital projects. So um, it will get spent as those projects progress. Right. And um, for that particular surplus, you said it will be reflected in the 2018 budget. How will we see that reflected? So through the chair, so a number of items uh, will be reflected uh, as adjustments uh, to uh, the 2018 uh, budget as you saw back in December. Uh, so primarily what you would have seen was the large adjustment to the transit revenue uh, number. We made an adjustment of over $7 million reflecting the, the significant ridership increase uh, in 2017, uh, some of which I, I think is, is starting to carry over into 2018. Um, so there was a, a fairly substantial adjustment of over $7 million made in the 2018 budget, result, um, somewhat resulting from what we realized in 2017. Um, there's a number of other um, facets to the, to the surplus, um, a number of delayed openings of some of our facilities, which will soon be starting to see those opening. Um, and because of the fact that we annualize our full budget, um, there were some surpluses created from that, um, but uh, we're obviously hoping that those facilities now will be opening in 2018 and uh, the resulting savings will not occur. Okay, so in, when, we're, when the next council looks at the 2019 budget, uh, the numbers that are going into the various accounts now will be reflected in the 2019 budget, but do we anticipate savings like this? Uh, did we plan for a f this, this 20, 24 million bucks or? Uh, through the chair, no, we did not plan for that type of uh, magnitude of a surplus. Um, I can just give you a, a rough estimate of, of over the last five years on average, we've realized an uh, average surplus of around $7 million. Okay. So to be, you know, put that in context, a $24 million surplus is well beyond what we actually projected um, you know, to occur. Okay, and the, the other 400000 is going into the General Rate Stabilization Fund? That's correct, uh, through the chair. That's just to top up to our, um, uh, the council approved 10% of operating surplus to have as a, effectively your contingency or rainy day fund um, to, you know, for unforeseen events or some significant loss of revenue or a significant cost uh, that would be incurred by, this, by the okay. city. So the 400 million, or the four, 400 million, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. The 400,000 takes us to that 10% level. If we were under that, we could have added two, three, whatever million to top us up. So we are topped up to the rate general stabilization fund now, totally. So, so through the chair, we're topped up to the amount that is required for 2017. Obviously, our budget changes year to year, um, likely increasing. Uh, so that target will move, shift slightly. Uh, we may uh, recommend um, as we have done in the past, uh, certain projects that do come forward from time to time to Council um, for funding, uh, GRS to fund some of those projects. So that may uh, create some withdrawals from that fund. Um, and therefore, if there are surpluses created in subsequent years, um, the first uh, sort of mark for those, those funds would be going to the General Rate Stabilization Reserve. Okay. Thank you very much. Happy to move it. Council um, Sprover. Expected, uh, or what would be the reason why there's such a, a, a large amount of uh, uh, being under budget? So through the chair, um, yes, there's a primarily uh, what what we're seeing in, in the planning and development area was um, some vacancies uh, related to their staffing. Um, I b also believe there was some um, some revenue additional revenue above forecast. Um, Again, similar to a lot of our other accounts, we budget sort of on an average basis. Uh, so in some years you're ahead of the head of the game, and in other years you're behind. Um, and that way we sort of make use of the general rate stabilization reserve as a bit of an automatic stabler in those cases, but primarily due to vacancies. Yes. Okay. So uh, through the uh, through the chair. So these uh, these these. Um, 
efficiencies will be reflected in the coming budget? So through the chair, um, again, if they're full-time complement um, and we plan to actually recruit for those positions, then the budget is still there and, I mean, depending on the timing at which we actually hire them in 2018, there could potentially be some savings related to them. Um, if they, the positions were hired and recruited towards the end of 2017 or January 1st, 2018, um, we wouldn't see those, those types of surpluses reoccurring. In any situation, whether it be planning or any other department, if we felt um, that there was an adjustment uh, that was to be made to any um, accounts because we didn't think we were going to hire the people, um, uh, we would have made those, uh, those adjustments to their budgets. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions? Um, Councilor Bowman has moved to receipt. All in favor? That carries. Uh, next is 9.2.2 Capital Project Financial Status Report, year end 2017 and budget amendment. Are there any questions in regards to that? Uh, Madam Mayor. Dave, can you speak to, um, a little bit to the shortfall in the federal gas tax funding? Uh, through the chair. Uh, so it, um, I believe when we planned these projects, um, there was um, the anticipation that all of the costs would be covered under the federal gas tax program. They changed some ineligible and eligibility requirements on that, so we had to sort of make a shift in that funding where it was not eligible to be recovered through the gas tax program. Uh, and so then we've obviously had to make that shift in terms of funding it from a, an alternate source. So from a, from a go-forward perspective, we don't expect any changes, I guess I'm trying to anticipate in future budgets that we will, we don't expect them to change the criteria in the future and that we shouldn't have any more, hopefully, no more surprises. <laughs> we could have provincial surprises, but. Uh, through the chair, I mean, I, I couldn't guarantee that. I know, I, I want We've, you to be a good guesser yeah. <laughs> is, is what I want. Because yeah. it's really hard to anticipate and change your budget when uh, the rules and the criteria change. In these two cases, it, collectively, it was a fair chunk of money for those both of those projects. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no other questions, the uh, recommendations uh, are there. Is there somebody want to move that? Madam Mayor, uh, all in favor? That's carried. 9.2.3 is a report from Paul Morrison, Director of Enforcement and Bylaw. Enforcement of illegal nuisance signs on city property and litter enforcement. We have uh, a couple of speakers, uh, Councilor Pleshi, then, then Councilor Gibson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just speaking to the report, it does talk a lot about um, uh, the illegally placed uh, signs, stickers, posters. Um, it doesn't talk a lot about the uh, illegally, illegal dumping. A while ago, I'd, I asked uh, Joe, um, I had made the comment about maybe increasing our fines uh, for dumping, and I think you had let me know that there was a report coming back. Is this that report? <clears throat> through, through the chair, no. Uh, this report was primarily on illegal signs that uh, we would look into it and the fines on the illegal dumping uh, I was incorrect when when I presumed it was that 500 it was 5,000 per per event so that we I did follow up to let you know that but if we need a report on that we can do that otherwise uh, and look into whether or not we want to increase from 5,000 and I, I guess I <clears throat> I don't want to start off by saying you know I want staff to go and and do any work and, and um, bring a report back, but, and I don't know if it's the fact that um, <clears throat> $5,000 isn't enough money or $5,000 just doesn't get us, if, if we're not laying the charges and collecting those dollars, 
that I, I don't really know. Um, and so that's what I really wanted to understand. If it was, you know, if, if I could today say, let's increase it to 10,000, you know, I'd do that because I'm, I'm just, I'm sick and tired of the dumping that's, that's happening. Speaking specifically then to just this report, <clears throat> I get a lot of, um, there's a lot of illegal dumping in our area of Ward 6. Um, and I'm sure there is, as uh, Councillor uh, Dillon and, and Councillor Sproveri in their areas, in the rural kind of areas. My questions that I get from residents are, people are backing into their farm access lanes, dumping garbage, um, sometimes getting caught, sometimes not. And then when it comes to them reporting it, they're not getting a lot of help from us, is what you know, what they're kind of saying to us. And even in the report, it speaks to, you know, they need to clean that up. When really, realistically, like, it's, they, have, they have a lot of property to, to cover and to maintain and look after, a lot of farmland. So, you know, where can we assist in that, make it a little bit easier for them to, um, to, to get it cleaned up and to also press those charges? So, through you, um, we have a couple things to prove when we go and investigate those uh, incidents. So we have to prove who dumped it, mm -hmm. and we have to prove where it came from, mm -hmm. and then we have to prove, we have to actually extend past that. It's not simply knowing that it's from company ABC, it's who actually did the dumping. Mm -hmm. And that's the toughest part of that investigation is, is proving that. And we rely on the complainants quite often to say, I can identify that person as the person who dumped the materials. That's the person we have to take to court. Mm -hmm. That's the tough part of this. These are not simple investigations. Um, and we try. Lots of times, the complainants don't want to go to court. Yep. They just want it cleaned up and they want to move on with their day. Yep. Uh, getting them to go to court, we try to, to encourage them to attend and it's quite often uh, an impossibility in some cases. So it's, we educate, we request and where possible they will come with, come with us to, to court, but they don't want to be identified. No, and I find a lot of the times, you know, those kind of the first offenders that call us or, or maybe it's second time, um, you know, they don't really want to go to court, but it's the, the five, six, seven, eight. I'll tell you two quick um, stories. One, uh, a property, it was dumped on, on their property in their farm lane, and, you know, they made the call to 311 and the response was, did you see anybody doing it? No, then you gotta get it cleaned up. Well, he's got a, he's got a backhoe, so he just pushed it on city property. Because, what, and, and what else are you supposed, to, you're supposed to do? Like, are we taking the stance like, no, that's your problem, even though it's other people that are, you know, maybe residents, maybe other residents from other municipalities dumping there. And a, another one, <clears throat> the homeowner caught the people in the farm lane, they got their van stuck, their van was empty, the garbage was out on the back door on his property, phoned the police, police came and said, did you see him do it? Well, to be honest, he said, no, I didn't actually see him. But they're here, there's two of them, they're stuck in my farm lane, and the garbage is right there. The garbage wasn't there an hour ago. Right. And there's nothing that the police could do. And that's the critical part when you go to court is identification of the offender. Uh, and, and we'll always have that as our biggest hurdle. So it's, we have to be able to identify. We do a lot through photographs. People have surveillance videos, et cetera. We can use that and then start to backtrack and go through the investigation and identify the person. That helps us, but not in every case does anybody have video. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we do go through the refuse and we look at names and we talk about you know, who owns it and we do do warnings. You can see in the report, we did 1,600 uh, investigations last year, and of those, we, we did 28 property cleanups ourselves, mm -hmm. and we uh, ended up six uh, court actions out of that. That's all we got, but I mean, we do try to be diligent when it comes to and that. And I know we do, I just, I guess what I'm looking for is, is, uh, is for our staff to, when they get that initial phone call, to be a little bit more sympathetic, because when the residents call us, it's, the city of Brampton told us it's our problem. I'm sure they didn't explain it to, to that way, but try and be as sympathetic as possible. Don't just r rhyme off the policies. 
you know, try and, and, and extend that helping hand to see what we, you know. So one of my takeaways from this is going to be uh, going back to uh, our communication section, our 311, and educating because they're the first point of contact for, of contact for many of these uh, our occurrences. Mm -hmm. And then we we'll look at our students, so we have very good students that do our summer refuse. So we'll look at that, a better a way of doing this. Okay, and then just on the flip side, if it's that raising 5000 to $10,000, if that's maybe enough to, to scare people away from dumping, maybe that's something that we should be talking about. I'm not asking for a report, but steer me in the right direction to kind of understand and get to where, you know, we need to start scaring these people. You know, the hammer sign, I don't know if that's working. <laughs> Yeah, I typically don't like to be uh, associated with scare tactics for what I used to do. But now, I mean, we look at uh, how we bring people to court, and we'll continue to look at that. Raising the fine is probably not going to be as, as much of a barrier to this in the sense that courts, although what we ask for is not always what we receive in the courts, yeah. we receive far less. So that's the challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to recognize the work that staff's doing on the nuisance signs. Thank I think it's getting better every year. Five, six years ago when Councilor Moore and I went on a uh, rampage about property standards and, and nuisance signs when we were chair and vice chair of enforcement, um, you know, we were pretty, uh, pretty upset about the way the city was starting to look. And um, I think we've come a long way. I think every year it's getting better. And this year I've certainly noticed this spring it's better, I think, better than it was last fall. Because that's usually when the signs start to go up in the spring and the fall. And um, I think we need to recognize that. And I hope that the next council, for those of you who are running and are uh, lucky enough to get elected again, you support the budget again to get more officers out there. Because there's nothing worse than a city that looks bad through, through these nuisance signs and, and bad property standards. So that's just a plug for you guys that are, and girls that are running a game and uh, for budget next, next time. Thank you, I can tell you, uh, as a matter of fact, we looked at different ways to improve our sign collection. Um, one of the barriers was we were driving Jeeps all the time. We, we had one pickup truck. Well, we've rejigged the fleet. Now we have more pickup trucks. We can throw more signs in the back. So we look at efficiencies throughout uh, our daily operations. Good. So appreciate, and the wisdom well of, thank you. No, we have uh, one more speaker, uh, Mayor Jeffrey. So I want to thank you for a thankless task. <clears throat> but the one thing that isn't in this report, and I find we're not really good at, is telling people not just fearing that they will be prosecuted, but they will be shamed in being caught. And one of the challenges is for us as a city is to educate people as to the cost of keeping our city clean. If you thought that if you caught somebody who was dumping, that it was going to cost you another half a point on your taxes, you'd get angry. So I really think that there is some opportunity through our communications department every spring to say, do you realize how much the city of Brampton spends in trying to keep your city looking good? Here's who you can call if you see somebody illegally dumping, get their license plate and we will prosecute. But in the meantime, this is what we're spending, and that number has been steadily growing. So I think there's an opportunity. I don't think we need it in a motion, but I, I can see Harry nodding. The work that you do is exponentially growing and is going to continue to grow if we don't have a way of telling people, the public, this is a cost on your tax bill right now, and it's only going to grow if you stay silent. You need to shame people into stopping littering and obviously we will prosecute but it, we bear the cost on our property taxes now and if we don't individually take ownership of this problem it's going to get worse so I think the communications is the only piece I see missing from this but I know it's a thankless task keep up the good work <coughs> thank you thank you chair can we get a motion to receive Councilor Willens all in favor that carries Next, we have a 9.2.4, a report and recommendation uh, regarding the bylaw to regulate parking on boulevards, front yards, and side yards. <coughs> Councillor Fortini. Uh, thank you, Peter Chair. Um, 
just a couple of questions and I always thought there was a 10 days for uh, compliance it says 21 days when you issue an order it's 21 days correct through the chair a property standards order it has to be a minimum of 21 days. 21 days so I'm looking at the diagram 9.24-2 and it's divided between the traffic bylaw and property standards. So if someone's parking on the grass at night and property standards doesn't work and bylaw, can I give a ticket? How do we catch these people on the grass if they're gone in the morning? So through the chair, the current situation is that our, our bylaw officers that are working overnight would attend, take pictures, and pass that information on to property standards so that they could issue a 21-day order. But again, that's not an ideal process. So what this looks to do is to allow us to be able to issue a ticket any time of day um, at the time of offense. Through our bylaw? Correct. That are working 24 hours a day. That's, that's great. And it doesn't affect like the boulevards as we talked Correct. outside. So if someone's parked sideways on the boulevard, they're fine to park if they have enough room. Correct. So this bylaw defines boulevard as the, the road allowance, which is not used as a sidewalk driveway access, which would include the paved driveway access and the boulevard and it doesn't include the traveled roadway or the shoulder. So it specifies, it, it basically identifies the grass portion of the boulevard as the area where you could get a ticket for parking on the boulevard, which is no different than what we're doing right now. I understand, correct. One more question. So all the, our compliance are, all have to be 21 days, it can't be shorter, or that's? Uh, through the chair, property standards orders have to be 21 have days. Be that's 20. legislated under the Building Code Act, so. And then well, is there a second order to comply, I think, if they don't meet the 21 days, or that's? No. There's one 21-day order issued. Unless, if we're talking about work that is going to exceed 21 days, then they'll obviously allow for time if somebody needs to have their, their roof redone. Um, but if it's something simple like parking on the grass, it would be a 21-day order. So with this new bylaw that would be eliminated, we'd be able to issue a ticket right away when we observe the offense. Right. Okay, great, thank you. Well. Councillor Willens. Thank you to the Chair. Thank you, Mike, for bringing this forward. This has been uh, a long time coming because we get a lot of complaints about that from the neighbours mostly and in the area, and this is great that you can get it through the AMP, through the AMP uh, process and get this ticket right away. So I'd be happy to move the report. Seeing no more questions, um, Councillor Willens has moved the recommendations, all in favor? That carries. Next is 9.2.5, report from the Manager of Health, Safety and Wellness, and Human Resources, fostering a healthy workplace, building the framework health and safety policy and workplace violence policy. No questions? Somebody want to move the recommendations? Councillor Gibson. All in favor? That passes. Thank you. <laughs> there was no new business. Thank you. Right. So there was no, oh, there was the um, note to file for the inclusion and equity committee. There was not enough quorum. So it was on consent, sorry. There's no correspondence. Councillor's question period. Councillor Sproveri. If you still hear me, um, I believe last month um, we referred a uh, report from staff uh, uh, to do with a couple of projects for uh, an amendment to the budget uh, to for various projects. Uh, the Goreway um, bridge was one of them, and then there was some to do with uh, Countryside Drive. And I believe uh, the mayor asked that this be referred for a report. Uh, did that ever come to us back, uh, or is that still outstanding? Mr. Well, Chair. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't recall that that referral, so um, I'll have to check with the clerk's office. So, but I have I have no report uh, standing by to report on it. Okay. 
Yeah, I think the the, uh, the issue was uh, the staff brought a report asking for an amendment to the uh, to the uh, capital budget for uh, various projects, uh, capital works projects, and um, and uh, the mayor had some concerns about the amount. I think it was in the order of uh, over 20 million, I believe, uh, and. Uh, Is that, is that the list? Is that the? Oh, I didn't. Okay, I missed that. So it was it was approved. Everything's good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Proveri. Councillor Fortini. Sorry, on 9.2 on the parking issue. If someone has a driveway, a single driveway, and I got a couple of calls on that, and they take actually the bus to go to work and they have a sir to come over and watch a newborn. They park on the road. Do they get, can they apply for a special permit because they got no parking in the driveway because you only have a single driveway? Because they're there all day from 7 till 7 p.m., 7 a.m.? Through the chair, there's only one type of permit that you can get and that's a parking consideration for 14 days right. per license plate. Uh, the city doesn't have any permit for any sort of long-term parking. So there would be nothing we could do for certain residents like that that, that take. Uh, There's nothing in the existing bylaw that would allow for that. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, fireworks weekend. Staff have anything to make a report on complaints, number of fireworks. Uh, Dealings we had to do over the weekend. I know my area was pretty bad. Quarter to quarter to one in the morning, fireworks are still going off. Yeah. And if not, will there, will there be a report coming forward in the future? Did you see that state of the call for you? Yeah. Are the horses dying? Uh, through the fireworks. Through the chair to Council Gibson, we can uh, bring that information back to you or forward it by email. Also, I'd ask our bylaw partners uh, with respect to their stats. Okay. I think, just if I can, just uh, I think by the end of the year we're going to have to, if if we don't do it now, do a review on how our latest um, bylaws is, is well, whether it's working or not working. My feeling is it's not. We're, we're trying to be nice, but um, it's getting still getting bad again, and there's still commercial fireworks being used out there. I don't know. Maybe the reports will show that. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But uh, I know my area, it was just terrible. There's no excuse for people putting them off at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. No, no, no excuse at all. So, Okay, thank you. Uh, we now move on to public question period where there's a five-minute limit in regards to any decision made under this section. Seeing none. There is nothing on the referred matters list. We may now move on to 11.1, .1, a briefing from Lowell Ruben Vaughn. Are there any questions for Lowell? Councillor Willens. Just a comment more than anything. Uh, thank you, Lowell. Um, I read through that, uh, I guess, a DMAF. Um, it's, it looks like there's some good opportunities there, but I guess. After talking to CEO Schlang, there may not be any opportunities with the floods in, in New Brunswick and the, and the state of out west. So, but go get them, Harry, on tomorrow, I guess, when you're in Ottawa. So thanks for the report, though. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And through you, um, Chair, I did want to touch base on that one. So I think we're all thinking on the same thing. We wanted to ensure from a staff perspective we are going. Um, we are doing our due diligence on this. There are a couple of uh, webinars that staff will participate in. Uh, if you look at the criteria, especially for the expression of interest, a lot of the um, boxes are ticked for Riverwalk in particular, especially from that uh, flood mitigation. And yes, there has been some natural uh, disasters from in Manitoba and New Brunswick. Um, but again, um, as we've all said around this table, um, the downtown Brampton, the full potential needs to be unlocked by this. And we're not only modeling for that 100 year storm, we're also modeling for that 200 storm. So um, we will definitely be putting our uh, best foot forward to ensure that we have all stakeholders behind me, as well as um, external partners, including um, the TRCA, who have been um, strong advocates for um, Riverwalk over the last um, couple of, since the beginning. 
I just really quickly on the other federal news, there is a regional, if I can just backtrack a little bit, there is a regional council meeting. Uh, one of the reports that we did highlight is in regards to a um, application between TRCA, the region appeal and the city uh, for a Federation of Canadian Municipalities um, climate change strategy. Um, there is an opportunity here and I think there is a good opportunity for the city to get some external funding on that as well. On the housing file, um, this has been a really hot topic. I've previously um, presented that there has been a lot of dollars that are starting to at least be announced. They haven't flowed yet from the federal government. Um, we know that uh, the region of Peel has a long affordable housing wait list, so hopefully working with the region as well as you know working through our uh, 2040 vision and um, our own, uh, as the city works towards developing its own affordable housing strategy for the first one, uh, we can work together in collaboration to ensure that housing needs within the city are, are met. Mm. Last thing on the... Uh, provincial election. Uh, May 17th was a deadline to um, get or candidates enrolled. Uh, there was at the last minute one slight change uh, in Brampton East with the PC candidate. Um, the new candidate there is Sudeep uh, Verma. So this is now the uh, complete, complete roster of candidates who are running amongst the uh, four major parties. Um, also, uh, just want to point out we are still moving forward with the social media strategy on our uh, provincial election strategy. So focusing on health, innovation, infrastructure, transit, as well as regional governance. So that work continues. And now that we have a complete uh, list, we are now circulating that document and soliciting uh, their feedback on questions. And also, some of you may have seen the opinion piece in the Toronto Star from the 27 uh, large mayors. Um, every day there seems to be a new announcement in terms of some form of a policy announcement as it relates to funding and sources of cuts. Um, so there are some concerns with um, things like the upload, which at the region appeal, that would be a $300 million if the uh, provincial government chose to re-download that to the, um, to, the, to the municipalities, as well as staff is looking at also the impact of any changes to the funding that we receive through the gas tax. Because again, that's not uh, small amounts. Um, we do rely on that as we continue to grow out our transit system and all the infrastructure uh, that is needed with that. And the last two points, it's kind of more of a, um, Public service announcement is next week is FCM in Ottawa, as well as the Big City Mayor's Caucus, and I know that uh, Mayor Jeffrey will be participating in both of those, the 31st to uh, June 3rd in Halifax. And also, this year will be slightly different because we will be dealing with new provincial ministers, but AMO is coming up in August, and very shortly at the, at the Committee of Council, we'll be seeing a report of proposed issues that we want to tackle uh, this year at AMO, and that's April, uh, sorry, August 18th to the 21st, I believe. So a report will be coming forward for your review, and as usual, staff will ensure that our delegation is well prepared um, heading into those meetings. So with that, thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Thanks so much, uh, Councillor Williams. Would you like to move a seat? All in favor? That carries. Uh, next is public question period. Again, it's five minutes limit regarding any decision made. None. We're going to now move into closed session. 13.1 was dealt with. It was acknowledged earlier on in the meeting. Uh, and 13.2 is labor relations uh, or employee negotiations, which is a labor relations matter. Uh, can I get a motion to move into closed session? Councillor Pleshi, all in favor? Carries.